Okay, we're good. Well, welcome and thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to see you here today and um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tim Michaels. I've been working with Tim for several years now and we've become good friends and uh, he, he, as far as I'm concerned, knows everything there is to know about the lower atmosphere on Mars or at least as close as anybody can get on this planet to date. Um, he got his degree from uh, Valfrey University and he went on to get his master's right here in the in the Bay Area at San Jose State University in 2002 and then he went on to work at the Southwest Research Institute um, and then last year we were lucky enough to have him join us here at SETI so now he's one of us even though he doesn't live here. So today he's going to be talking about what he says is some of his unfinished projects which I'm sure he could go on for hours. <laughs> I'm sure we all could. So um, Tim tell us about it. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I'm going to tell you um, sort of a little story. Um, if I were sightseeing on Mars, these are some of the things that I might look for today. So some of the things that we know exist today on Mars that we didn't exist knew. Um, we didn't know these things existed uh, too long ago. Actually, a lot of them. Um, so I'll start in by. Uh, going through an outline, a very quick outline. Um, first, I'm going to start with a historical perspective. Um, haven't we always known these things? No, we haven't. Um, and we've, a lot of these things we haven't known for very long. Um, and then I'm going to go into, for those of you that aren't familiar with some basic things about Mars, I'll go into that. Hint, it's not completely like Earth, in case you were wondering. Um, Today's itinerary will be getting acquainted with the wind, and we'll get into what that actually means uh, a little later. Uh, dust devils, the Arcea Mons spiral dust cloud, dunes and ripples in motion, uh, carbon dioxide convective clouds in the polar regions of Mars, um, carbon dioxide jets, and I'll explain more what those are later as well, and recurring slope linear, or RSL for short. Um, and then some concluding remarks. And uh, by then, you should be ready for me to stop talking. So um, to start out with a historical perspective, um, humanity has noticed Mars for, since time immemorial, um, wondering and imagining what, uh, what it must be. Uh, it's obviously there. Uh, this is a, an image of Mars, uh, the red one, obviously, and, and Regulus um, in the constellation Leo. Um, Thousands of years ago, this is what people saw. And this is what people knew about Mars. Uh, they made up or imagined other things. Um, but this is what they could say as hard fact. Um, with the invention and refinement of the telescope, um, it aided the realization that Mars was uh, a separate world. Um, but it didn't give enough, give enough detail to really constrain a lot of things about Mars. So conjecture and imagination ran rampant, and, and, and rightly so. If you don't know something about um, a place, uh, try to figure out what, what it might be. Um, so this is a map uh, from Giovanni Schiaparelli in 1886 showing features that were later interpreted, and, and frankly, Schiaparelli uh, thought this too, as um, later interpreted by Lowell as being canals, perhaps, on Mars, by, created by s either uh, a current civilization or some past civilization. Um, but by the time 1909 rolled around and some larger telescopes, like the 40-inch telescope um, at Yerkes Observatory uh, in Wisconsin, um, we were able to see more details about Mars, enough details to start questioning whether these lines that uh, Lowell and Schiaparelli saw on Mars in fuzzy eyepieces uh, actually were there or not. But not enough detail to know whether or not there was truly vegetation on Mars or not, or whether there are cities on Mars, or towns, or rabbits running around. Uh, you couldn't tell that. So the next phase of our knowledge, the current knowledge of Mars, um, began in 1965 when the Mariner 4 spacecraft um, flew by and saw a world that 
looked something in between Earth and Earth's moon. It had a lot of craters on it. Uh, there were no obvious signs of uh, settlements or anything like that. No canals, uh, no obvious signs of biological enclaves of any sort, no seas. Uh, just dust, sand, ices, and rock. Um, sometimes they're piled up in interesting ways and they move and change in interesting ways, but in the end it's dust, sand, ices, and rock. Um, and Mariner 9 um, in 1971 um, even further confirm this with uh, more detailed uh, imaging that Mars is not what most people had imagined. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, from orbit, more detail followed. The Viking missions, the twin Viking orbiters, um, contributed an enormous amount to our knowledge of Mars. Um, this image on the left is uh, an image of some dust devils, some very large dust devils, these little white things with shadows um, in Amazonas Planitia. They were, this was one of the earliest pictures of Mars that showed us something small scale that was going on right now, something fleeting that happened. And if you took another picture, it would be different. Um, all the other pictures of Mars, uh, with the exception of the ice caps changing with the seasons, really didn't show, and, and dust storms, really didn't show much change from day to day or even year to year. Um, the Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft came in the late 90s or mid 90s and also um, enormously contributed to uh, to our knowledge of the planet at higher and higher resolutions. These, for example, are um, gullies that occur in many places on Mars that may, some of them may have been caused by liquid water at some point or another. Some of them may have been um, carved by pieces of ice careening downhill. Um, the jury is still out on a lot of these, and there may be multiple processes creating similar looking things. Um, nevertheless, uh, when you look at these pictures, you, you crave for more detail um, and a more human perspective. You know, humans aren't used to thinking of being 200 kilometers or 2,000 kilometers above Earth, nevertheless Mars, and looking down and saying, oh, I know what that is. It's, it's a foreign perspective for most people. Uh, you can be trained to understand, to interpret what these satellite uh, images um, are, but there's something deep inside us that perhaps balks at that. So the first sort of human perspective of Mars was provided by the two Viking landers in 1976. Um, from their vantage point, we could actually see the seasons change. Um, you could see the frost come and go with the seasons uh, in a patchy uh, sense, just like you can when, um, well, perhaps not in this part of California, but in other places where there's frost on the windshield and, and, and such things. Um, and they also dug into the soil and saw that if you disturbed the soil, um, it would change. Uh, it would be blown away. It would be sort of reset to something closer to what it was before it was disturbed. But there wasn't a lot of change that they saw for things that hadn't been disturbed. And that may be in part because the resolution of the cameras. Uh, they could only see things sort of centimeter in size on the ground. Um, but it may also be because of where they were located. They're located in parts of Mars where, frankly, not a whole lot's going on right now. Even, even now, we don't think a whole lot's going on there. Um, it, so it's a, it's a cautionary tale that if you land at one or two places on Mars, particularly places that are similar, and see nothing happen, you don't extrapolate and say there's nothing happening on this entire planet. Um, so, then came the rovers. Um, the Viking landers were just that. They were landers. They couldn't move. Uh, they had an arm that could move around, and that's it. Um, the first one was the Sojourner rover, a tiny little rover um, on the Pathfinder mission. And it sort of opened our eyes about what rovers could do. And that knowledge was 
um, used for the Mars Exploration Rovers, or the MERs for short. Um, their names are Spirit and Opportunity. Um, Spirit landed in a, a crater, a big crater, called Gusev Crater, and um, approximately on the other side of Mars, but both uh, <laughs> near the equator, uh, Opportunity landed uh, at a place called Meridiani Planum, which had a funny, funny chemical signatures of, of hematite and other things that was hard to explain from orbit. And that's why, one of the reasons why they picked the site. The other reason was because it was the safest site um, for landing, uh, because they were coming down on parachutes and they wanted to be careful of sites that had um, strong winds, particularly a strong wind shear in the vertical. Um, so the rovers, the big thing with the rovers is if, if you don't land where you're the excitement is, or if you can't land where the excitement is, you can drive over to it, at least if your capabilities are, um, are great enough. Um, additionally, the, uh, imagers like the high-rise uh, camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which can, uh, has a resolution, an imaging resolution of about 25 centimeters per pixel at its highest resolution. They're invaluable for putting uh, these rover observations in context. You can actually look down and see the rover, see where it's driven, see what it's driven through, see what's, what it missed right beside it, what it couldn't see that was uh, 100 meters away. You know, maybe even go back to it if it was uh, an interesting enough thing that it missed. And also plan out these things in advance. Um, and that's what the, the right image is showing, is some of opportunities to traverse around a, a smallish to medium-sized crater called Victoria Crater that has some um, alien features, uh, some s piles of sand and things in the bottom of it. OK, so we've moved into an era where Mars, we can see Mars at very high resolution, both from rovers and from instruments like HiRISE. Um, but we still need to cover a little bit about what Mars actually is, for those of you that may not know. Um, some basics. This is a topographic map of Mars um, uh, created with a, a laser altimeter that um, is something like 400 million shots to figure out what the topography of Mars was uh, on the Mars Global Surveyor Mission. Um, Mars is about half diameter of Earth, but it has a similar land area, and that's something to keep in mind. 75% um, or so of Earth is water. Um, so Mars actually has about the same amount of Earth, the same amount of ground or land to cover um, comp uh, compared to Earth. Um, so, so you shouldn't think of it as a, a miniature planet that has a lot less things to look at. It's a, it's a very large surface area of land. Um, has volcanic edifices, some of which you can see off to the left here. Uh, this is the Tharsis region, and uh, Olympus Mons, where I'm pointing right now, is the largest volcano in the solar system. It sticks up around uh, 20, 21 kilometers above the surrounding plain. Uh, it's, it's very tall. Um, there, Mars has a, an orbit that's much more um, eccentric than Earth's orbit. Earth's orbit is very nearly round or circular. Um, Mars's orbit is much more oval shaped. And because of that, at perihelion, when it's closest to the sun, it gets 35% more um, sunlight, more energy from the sun than it does at aphelion when it's farthest away from the sun. And that's an important difference between Mars and Earth. It means that um, on one part of the planet, summer is different than the summer in the other hemisphere and uh, vice versa with winter. Um, in the current configuration, it means that the planet receives more insulation, more solar energy from the sun, 35% more uh, in the southern hemisphere summer than it does in the northern hemisphere summer. Um, by the way, sometimes I'll use these, the so-called Elsebes index, uh, which is a seasonal index, where Elsebes equals zero corresponds to the northern hemisphere vernal or spring equinox. Um, and there are permanent and seasonal, seasonal polar caps that aren't shown on this map um, of water ice and CO2 ice. The northern 
polar cap is mostly water ice. It does have a seasonal CO2 ice cap that forms on it in the winter, but then sublimes away uh, in the spring. And the southern hemisphere has sort of a mostly a CO2 ice cap, um, but it's much smaller than the water ice cap in the north. Uh, but there's also buried water ice there as well, and it also has a seasonal polar cap with mostly CO2 ice. So a few more basics. Um, I'm an atmospheric scientist, uh, an atmospheric modeler. Um, so a lot of this talk is going to be biased towards the atmosphere and its interactions with the surface. Um, so it has an atmosphere. It's not just rock. Um, the atmosphere is made of 95% CO2. Um, there's a little bit of uh, argon and nitrogen making up most of the balance of the rest. Um, the surface pressure is between 1 and 15 hectopascal or millibars, if, if that's a more convenient unit, which is um, approximately one hundredth, uh, several hundred, several, well, approximately a hundredth, a hundredth to a thousandth of the, the pressure of Earth's atmosphere at sea level. Um, but there is a huge uh, seasonal change. Here on Earth, at sea level, the, or anywhere else really, the pressure really doesn't change very much from season to season, from day to day. Um, but on Mars, um, from, from winter to, to summer, and it depends on which winter and summer it is, whether it's northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, it can change up to 25%. The pressure can change. It's like going from uh, sea level in the summertime, for example, up to the top of some of the Colorado Rockies in the wintertime. That's how big of a change it is. Um, and there are clouds there. Uh, some of the pictures that you may have seen recently coming out of the, the crop of orbiters that have gone around Mars in the last uh, decade or so, they tend to show Mars in the daytime uh, and all in the daytime. You don't see the morning at all. And it tends to give an impression that Mars is not that cloudy of a place. But beware, at night there are huge sections of Mars that have very thick clouds. Not very thick in the sense of Earth clouds. They are water ice clouds and there is a limited amount of water vapor in the atmosphere to condense out. But they are very thick by Martian standards and they're very widespread as this picture um, to the right here shows uh, that's Olympus Mons poking out through the clouds in the morning. This is an image taken by one of the Viking orbiters. And this image on the left uh, shows the atmosphere of Mars above the, its surface. It really is there, and you can see it. Um, and part of the structure you're seeing are, are dust layers in the atmosphere. Okay, so. Um, moving on, our first stop, getting acquainted with the wind. What do I mean by that? So if you're in a protective suit, um, would you even notice whether it was windy or not on Mars? It, it, it's one thing that is often glossed over. Um, for example, a sustained 40 meter per second wind on Mars, uh, which is hurricane strength, uh, a decent hurricane strength wind um, on Mars, has a kinetic energy that's equivalent to a 5 meter per second wind or a breeze on Earth. Uh, at sea level. Um, so it really needs to be a strong wind for you to be able to feel it in any sort of spacesuit-ish type uh, clothing. Uh, otherwise, you're just not going to notice that it's that's windy necessarily. Um, if you want to experience this firsthand, you might want to visit one or two of the planet's windiest locales to help convince you that you know, this air really is moving. It's just not something we made up. Um, one of those locales is Dedalia Planum, which is what is shown here. This is Arcea Mons, which is the southernmost of the Tharsis volcano. And these streaks that sort of radiate somewhat out from the volcano are, are just that. They're streaks on the surface, uh, wind streaks on the surface, um, caused by wind. Um, we aren't completely sure whether or not they are from some relic bygone era or are currently forming or being maintained. But I'll show you some things that suggest that maybe the, the latter is true, that they're being currently formed and at least maintained uh, now. Um, 
So uh, if you took a relatively high resolution atmospheric model, uh, like those that I run for Mars, and you feed into the topography and other things about Mars and um, the, sun, uh, the sun's energy that gets absorbed by the surface and the atmosphere and everything moves around, you end up with uh, a three-dimensional picture that, that changes in time of, of Mars's atmosphere. And this is, this is one of the reasons why those uh, features I just showed you are oriented the way they are. At night, the air flows downhill, roughly. It is uh, torqued by other things and, and, and turned. It doesn't flow directly downhill, but it does generally flow downhill. Um, and that has to do with the cooling uh, effect of the air over the, the Tharsis uh, volcanoes and the, Tharsis, the overall Tharsis plateau, which is this big built up uh, region around the volcanoes. Um, but during the day, it's upslope flow. It goes up the mountain and breathes. Every day, it's either upslope or downslope. And there's a very brief uh, transition time in between there where it's sort of a lull in the wind. But the rest of the day, the wind is relatively screaming for Mars, you know, tens of meters per second uh, near the surface. And at some uh, seasons, it is more, uh, is more strong than others, the wind. Um, so I decided to look at why these are some examples of the, the wind streaks that I'm talking about at, at sort of smaller scales. Each of these craters is several kilometers across. So you can gauge that each of the wind streaks themselves is maybe 10, 15, 20 kilometers long. Um, there are different sizes of wind streaks. There are some that are very large and some that are medium like these. Um, but I decided to look at these because they're two-toned. Uh, there's, a, there's a dark component to them and there's a light component to them. And sometimes th th they occur in very complicated uh, patterns between light and dark. So I decided to try to model these at very high resolution um, to see whether I could get enhancements of the wind or dehancements of the wind, slowing down of the wind that might explain how these are created. And lo and behold, I got some results that are are quite compelling, I think. Uh, it's not the last word by any means, and it's still work in progress. But you can get asymmetries, like in this, this upper um, wind streak, there's an asymmetry. The, the, the dark, there isn't a dark side on, the, on the, uh, the, uh, the upper part, but there is uh, this long streamer on the lower part. And I get sort of that pattern in the, the wind stress. It's basically how, how hard the wind is pushing on the ground, on, on sand or dust or whatever that might be on the ground. Um, and these patterns suggest, in this pattern, it suggests that the wind is actually lower, perhaps, in the dark regions um, than, than in some of the other regions. Again, I don't know if these correspond 100% to this image, but it's certainly, there's some sensitivity to that. And there's some capability for wind passing over a crater to create these sort of shapes. Um, and this is another example of a more symmetric one, but that has a sort of a scouring action, a very strong wind stress. Um, behind, uh, in the lee of, of the obstacle, in this case, a crater. So let's move on to the Arsiamon spiral dust cloud. What is this thing? This is, a, this is something that was noticed in, um, in Mars orbiter camera mock images um, from the, during the Mars Global Surveyor mission. And it's been re-imaged since. It's something that happens over the top over the summit of Arsia Mons, which is the southernmost of the Tharsis volcanoes, um, every year at about the same time of year, about the same season. Uh, it's this gigantic spiral cloud of mostly dust, but there's some water ice clouds that are mixed in um, as well uh, that have been captured there. And so my advisor at the time, uh, Scott Rafkin and myself and others, 
um, decided to look at this with the atmospheric model. You know, why is this thing? Why does this thing exist, and what causes it? Um, and it turns out it's this upslope flow that I showed you. Um, I don't know if anyone caught it, but there was actually this spiral business um, at the near the top of the mountain. It wasn't over the top of the mountain in those last plots, but it was there. Um, and it turns out that that spiraling action is there all year round. But at this particular season that they see this cloud, it, the, eight, the, the symmetry is right that the, the convergence of dust, the, these winds that are blowing up the mountain during the day are laden with dust and water vapor and other things. Um, and when they meet at the, the top of the volcano, they sort of form this huge chimney of material that, that goes up to great heights. And, but it's, it's spiraling at the same time, partly because of the planet's rotation, perhaps, but, and partly because of other dynamical reasons. Um, and that's what creates this cloud, it's a whole bunch of dust that's been gathered over millions of square kilometers uh, is being brought together at a relative point and then spiraling upwards. Um, and the only reason we think it doesn't happen at other seasons, it happens uh, around El Sebes 180, um, is it's the symmetry is wrong. Uh, there isn't enough dust uh, that's, the dust doesn't converge well enough. It's, it's too diffuse still at the other seasons to be able to see. And so if you were standing at the caldera, so going back to the sightseeing business, if you were standing at the edge of the caldera, the, the sort of big crater uh, shape thing that's at the top of the volcano and looking at this you would see this gigantic cloud up in the uh, in the sky uh, that's that's dusty and it would probably be tra translating moving rotating slowly because it does change with time and it would only be at a certain part of the day it's only there for uh, the middle of the day uh, in the morning early morning it's not there and in the evening it's not there and at night it's not there Okay, moving on to dust devils. Um, these are some examples of dust devils. These are some examples of the large Amazonas planitia ones that I showed earlier. Uh, the ones in Amazonas planitia uh, can be nearly 10 kilometers tall and sometimes one kilometer wide. These things are the size even bigger than terrestrial tornadoes. They're not as strong, but size-wise, they're very large. Um, and as far as we know, in the Amazonas Planitia region, for some reason, that's where the big ones are. There are dust devils in much of the rest of the planet for most of the year during the day, because that's the only time of day the dust devils actually occur is during the day because of the way they form and work. Um, but for some reason that we still haven't figured out, uh, the big ones are all in the Amazonas Planitia region, we think. Uh, the bottom image shows a bunch of dust devils all at the same time captured by the Spirit rover, um, the rover Spirit, I guess, uh, in Gusev Crater. Uh, Gusev Crater has a lot of dust devils. Um, they're relatively smallish, but they do enough work that uh, there are parts of Gusev Crater, if you look at an image, that look dark. but the surface really isn't uh, coherently dark. It's just covered with um, hundreds or thousands of dust devil tracks that haven't been erased. But they do get occasionally erased um, by dust storms and other things. Um, one thing is, is that these would happen everywhere on Mars if all of Mars wasn't too windy or if there was dust availability enough dust availability everywhere. The dust was able to be moved by winds that you could get on Mars. But in places where it's too windy, these, the, the structures that create the, the dust devils can't operate. They get ripped apart by the wind shear, the vertical wind shear in the atmosphere. And so in Dedalia Planum, for example, I would not expect to see any dust devils because they're going to be ripped apart by these, these forces. Um, but there are other places, very large swaths of Mars, where these things happen day in and day out. And sometimes they have seasonal patterns where fewer of them will happen, or fewer of the ones that are 
big and easy to see, bigger and easy to see will happen on a seasonal basis. And there are other places where there may just not be very much dust on the ground or it can't be moved for whatever reason. Maybe there's no sand to help kick up the dust. Um, and you may not see dust devils because of that. The, the circulations might be there. It might be spinning. But the only way you can see a dust devil is if there's dust in it, enough dust in it, enough contrast for you to be able to say, hey, there's something there. It's not invisible. So this is sort of a very complicated and, and messy uh, image that shows some of what creates a dust devil. It's the daytime boundary layer turbulence. Um, when you are outside, um, perhaps in the desert, on a nice, bright, sunny day, it will be very gusty. Those gusts are these parts of these turbulent cells, these cells that are kilometers across, that are moving along with the mean wind over you. So sometimes you'll get um, wind that's pushing down uh, quickly at you, and sometimes you'll be sort of in the middle of these cells where it's relatively calm, and then you'll get another gust. Um, these black dots, this is actually the pressure field here, this green one, these black dots are um, potential dust devil circulations. And I say potential because not all of those will extend down to the ground. There will be some that just never make it to the ground and never pick up any dust. It doesn't mean they're not there and they're spinning still. So, so the question is, are these, is this image, uh, the, this plotted data from a simulation or from observational data? It's a simulation. We do not have observational data like this for Earth, nevertheless Mars. Um, uh, the, the grid spacing that you would have to use, the, the spacing between uh, points that you compute the state of the atmosphere for a simulation like this would be 100 meters or less, 100 meters to tens of meters. Um, it, it's a very um, computationally intensive simulation that creates these. But you can, from first principles, first physical principles, come up with dust devils if you uh, give it the right inputs, or the right realistic inputs. Uh, let's see. So the last thing on dust devils is I said, okay, well, we can create dust devils in simulations. Um, can we create dust devil tracks like the ones that we see? And this is, is an example of a, of a mock image uh, of a dust devil track. This is actually the shadow of the dust devil, but this is the track that is left, and potentially this as well. Um, the dust devils don't necessarily move in a straight line, and it's because of that convective turbulence. Those cells are moving all around um, not necessarily in a straight line. Uh, in the mean, in some average sense, they're moving in a straight line with the mean wind, but they, they deviate from that in a random manner. And so the dust devils can also deviate from, from a straight line. Um, this image in particular shows uh, this sort of cycloidal uh, appearance to it. Uh, these circles, uh, or, or a sort of a circular path that it takes or that it creates. But not all the dust devil tracks in this image are, are that way. A lot of them are sort of filamentous. They, you know, they're just lines. So, so why is that? Is it just the size of the dust devil, for example? You know, maybe the, the image resolution isn't enough to see this cycloidal uh, behavior in the smaller tracks. Um, and it turns out that 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 cyclical behavior just is absent in a lot of those smaller, in most of those smaller tracks. And I think I know why, but I can't prove it for sure until we actually observe a dust devil and measure it um, on the ground, on Mars. But when I did modeling of this, this, is, this shows where a model dust devil was at different times, and this is the track it left. Uh, the darker, or sort of the grayer the, the color, the more material it's moved. So, so I would say that the, the track is mostly the gray, um, the gray and black colors here. And notice it did this, it kind of looked like it did a, a U-turn here, but it didn't really do a U-turn. It's just that 
um, for most of this, most of the track, only one part, one half of the dust devil was actually lifting very much dust. The rest wasn't. And it has to do with uh, constructive interference. The wind is roughly moving from left to right here. Um, so, and, and the dust devil was rotating in a clockwise direction. So in that sector of that half of the dust devil, those two winds combined forces. They didn't cancel each other out or, or work against each other. And so it's, it's easiest for it to lift dust on that edge. But by this point, the dust devil had gotten strong enough that it could cancel out the effect of the, the mean wind that was acting on it. And so they could lift dust um, over all of, the all of the circumference at the bottom. Um, and I think that is probably what creates these sort of tracks are um, especially strong dust devils that are counteracting the mean wind, uh, the effects of the mean wind that tend to create just a, a filamentous track because only one part of the dust devil is lifting. Um, on to dunes and ripples on the move. Um, there are these dunes at, at, in a place called Nilipatera, uh, which is near the equator, uh, relatively on Mars. Um, these are taken less than one season apart. These are high-rise imagery, so these are um, probably 25 centimeters or 50 centimeters per pixel. Um, and they exhibit meter scale modification and movement of the ripples and the edge of the, the slip face of, of the, the dune. You can see that this edge here is actually moving forward with time. And these ripples that are superimposed on these dune um, structures are also moving over less than a Martian season. So this, hasn't, this isn't something that happened 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago or 10 million years ago. This is happening now. So I decided, OK, well, let's do some modeling and see if we can, atmospheric modeling, and see if we can explain this. Why are these things moving? And what, what are, what's causing the winds? They're clearly doing something here. This is a, a model animation. There's a, a Viking orbiter color base image below there. I call attention, this is Nili Patera itself. There's a, there's a caldera there, a whole, big hole in the ground. But there's this albedo feature that runs along here like so. That's not something the model produces. That's something that you've observed on Mars. And notice that these, these contours, which are, are wind stress, again, how, how hard it's, it's um, pushing on the ground, uh, at one point in this, in this animation, line up almost exactly with the albedo pattern. Basically, there's this, this phenomenon in the atmosphere that acts like an ocean wave washing up on the beach. And its maximum extent is where that, the dark albedo pattern starts. So that's, it washes all the sand up to that point, and then it comes back. And it basically keeps um, the area that it occurs over, this, er this lighter toned area, relatively free of sand. Sand doesn't stay there for any length of time. This only happens at certain seasons, however. And it only happens for 10 to 20 minutes each day. That's it. So, so those dunes have 10 to 20 minutes of sand, or at least the model simulation suggests, they only have 10 to 20 minutes at a certain season to, to move. And this is actually start, starting to be, as more and more high-rise imagery come in, comes in, and you can see sort of the seasonality of these changes, it's starting to become obvious that, that this is probably the case. There are, there are parts of the season where it doesn't move. Uh, in any appreciable way, and there are other parts of the season where it moves a lot. So plan your trip, trip accordingly. If you're, you know, with uh, outside that 10, 20 minute window, and if you're outside of the seasonal uh, occurrence of these things, forget it. It's just going to be light winds and some pretty dunes to see, which you know isn't bad, but it's perhaps not what you might expect to see. Um, this just shows the seasonality of it. Um, as you can see, it's, it's most prevalent at Elsebest 210 and Elsebest 300. Um, that is the, the northern fall and the northern winter seasons. But in the other two, the other half of the year, 
it's non-existent. There really isn't any movement going on at these dunes at the other time of year. So on to CO2 <coughs> carbon dioxide convective clouds. Um, so early MGS MOLA and radio science results um, suggested that there, were, there was something in the way of the, of the laser pulse return. It was hitting something that was reflecting the signal back to the spacecraft before it actually hit the ground. Um, and since water ice clouds couldn't do it, it was immediately speculated that it might be CO2 ice clouds because most of Mars's atmosphere is carbon dioxide. So there's lots of mass to create dense clouds, clouds dense enough to reflect a laser pulse like that back to the uh, spacecraft as strongly as it was seen. Um, Colapreet et al. in 2003 um, modeled such clouds in, in 1D um, using a, de a detailed microphysical model, um, uh, a cloud model that, that took into account all we could think of to put in a model to try to come up with these clouds. And, and that paper argued and showed that it was at least plausible that these clouds could exist. Um, and that they were moist convective in nature. They were more like terrestrial thunderstorms than they were cirrus clouds, for example, which are uh, ice clouds, sort of the wispy ice clouds that you can sometimes see in the sky here. Um, they're still ice clouds, but they're convective. And there's late energy being released that's further driving their development. Um, Colapreet et al. in 2005 later included these within fully 3D GCM simulations, um, which continued this, this plausibility argument. And um, Paul Hain et al. in 2012 actually used uh, Mars Climate Sounder data uh, to map these things, to be able to see these in the polar night. These, these things happen in the night. You can't see them in the daytime. Um, they happen during the part of the year where the, the south polar and north polar caps are in darkness 24 hours a day. Um, but this is an infrared instrument that was able to peer into the, the darkness and see that there are clouds like these all over the place. And furthermore, it was able to see in the vertical that these clouds, where these clouds were in the vertical and that there was um, there were some of these carbon dioxide ice particles that were making it all the way to the ground. So there, there probably really is CO2 snowfall hitting the ground in the Mars' polar region. That's not all, that's a probably only a small fraction or a smaller fraction of what builds up, the CO2 ice that builds up um, in the seasonal caps in the winter. But it, uh, it's something that's probably happening and that you can be there to watch these. I also did some modeling of these. And these are simulations where the grid spacing is even further. These are 75 meter grid spacing simulations. So, and they're very expensive because cloud, computing clouds forming and changing is very, very computationally expensive if you do it correctly or, or if you try to do it as correctly as you, as you can within your, your capabilities. Um, so first of all, in my simulations, after um, 1,100 seconds after I start, um, you get some clouds that form in this layer. This is the layer where um, conditions are just right to touch off the, the process. And then after 1,400 seconds, you start getting these, these towers. These, there's latent heat being released, and it's creating upward motions um, that are driving these, these towers that are somewhat akin to thunderstorm towers on Earth um, upward. And the scale on these, by the way, these are in meters. So you know, this is two kilometers across this, this area. Um, so these aren't large things necessarily, but they may be quite widespread. Um, and I'll show you in a minute that they might also recharge potentially qu quickly. Um, and then after 1,900 seconds, they've sort of come to a, a mature stage or, or at least a middle age stage, and then there's a uh, at, at that point, there are actually precipitation tails present. And you can't see them very well on, on these images, but there's another one that I'll show you in just a minute that shows that better. And then after that, the, these towers organize into la larger, more efficient structures, more efficient energetically. And then after that, they, they die. They, they dissipate. Um, 
So this just shows the effect of, of the clouds on supersaturation, sort of how close uh, the atmosphere is to producing more clouds, more CO2 clouds. And initially, there's lots of supersaturation. And that's what touches off the clouds. But by the time the clouds are over, you've lost all of that supersaturation. There's no more potential right then to make any more carbon dioxide clouds. However, quickly, within half a Martian day, you build uh, much of that supersaturation back up. So within a Martian day or so, um, <coughs> under the simulation conditions, um, the physics that I have in the model suggests that you can build things up to have another day of convective storms at that location on Mars. So, so maybe there are repeated, like Florida, you know, with thunderstorms every day, uh, every afternoon. Um, maybe in the polar night, in a lot of places, there are CO2 storms, convective storms, every afternoon, potentially. And these are the, the precipitation tails. This is where the snow would come out of the clouds and, and potentially hit the ground. Um, the, the, the black uh, outlines are showing where the clouds are, and these are showing where the largest particles are. Some of the particles can get um, 100 microns, uh, a millimeter in size, uh, that, are, that are hitting the ground. So these really are things that you would call snow. OK, on to CO2 jets. Um, there, in the southern polar caps in the spring, there are these phenomenon that all these dark spots start showing up on top of the CO2 ice. There's still a lot of CO2 ice there. But all these dark spots and dark fans and, and features start showing up. And spectrally, they look like dust. They're almost certainly dust. But how is the dust getting from underneath the ice? and creating these the, the spotted uh, appearance. So uh, Kiefer in 2007 and Piquet and Christensen in 2008 offered detailed conceptual models for why these uh, may occur. And it boils down to um, energy somehow gets through the ice, underneath the ice when the sun comes up, or perhaps even a little bit before the sun comes up, um, it might get uh, energy from the subsurface, and it, it sublimates some of the CO2 ice on the bottom of the CO2 ice sort of slab. And so it, it pressurizes that gas underneath there. And when the CO2 ice above it um, s sort of reaches a, a certain limit, it, it fails. And it, there's a crack that's create, you know, that, that occurs, and that pressurized gas comes out very rapidly and can take with it, because it's moving so rapidly, a bunch of dust and, and other material that was underneath the CO2 ice. That's the premise behind these. Um, and if you furthermore, if you, you think of one of these things, uh, if you turn it into a model and think of one of these things as a, a, a nozzle, a convergent divergent nozzle, for example, where as I've sort of schematically shown here, you have the, the atmosphere above there, you have the surface of the CO2 ice, and then you have the, the vent through the, the CO2 ice that's sitting there, the crack, whatever it may be. And then you have the pressurized gas reservoir that's underneath that. It's pressurized because of the weight of the CO2 ice above it. And then you have the permanent substrate, which in this case would be dirt, uh, dust, sand mixed together. Um, so this also implies, if this is the case, um, that the velocity, the venting velocity of these things is near Mach 1. You know, 200 meters per second these things are coming out of the ground at. Uh, the gas is coming out of the ground. The, the dust contained in that gas is coming out of the ground and spewing into the atmosphere. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, I call them jets and not geysers because geysers are sort of a, something requires liquid and, and, and other things that are more, that are not this. So I call them jets. So I decided, well, let's be really crazy and let's take the, uh, the model grid spacing down to 
five meters, one and a half meters. Um, incredibly computationally expensive. The time step I have to use is four ten thousandths of a second. Um, it takes two weeks to run uh, several seconds of these simulations. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but but the, the answers you get out are really interesting. Um, the, uh, the upstream pressure, so, so the pressure of the, the, the gas reservoir is 37 millibars. That's roughly three, um, you know, to even 10 times what the, the surface pressure is. The air pressure is above that. So that's why these things are coming out so fast. It's pre really pressurized underneath. And this is with only um, 62 and a half uh, centimeters of CO2 ice above there. Um, this is a, a, a simulation I did uh, after 1.9 seconds. The gas has come out, this is meters, so the, the, the tip of the gas has come out 70 meters. And the reason it doesn't go higher is because the atmosphere is, is stratified. There's an inversion, a temperature inversion there, and it's very difficult. It takes a lot of energy to move things upwards. There's a lot of energy in this plume, but it's only able to get it up maybe 100 meters at most. Um, and it also spreads out sideways. The, uh, the reason it's not symmetric is that there are, uh, the flow interacts with itself to create secondary circulations. It, it, it's so violent, um, it, it actually splits the jet apart, the, the plume apart into, into different pieces. And you can imagine that if there was a, a different wind direction for this part of the plume than for this part of the plume, you could get things that look like this. This is a high-rise image of one of these things, where this might be the main, eh, where's my pointer? This might be the main plume, this part uh, hitting the ground, and this might be a part that's being blown by a slightly different wind, um, maybe this part. So you can imagine that this might be consistent with those. What is the scale of the uh, This is, a few hundred meters, I believe. Uh, order 100 meters across this image, I believe. Uh, these things are pretty small. And the spots, uh, so these are sort of the, the fans, they're called. Um, but the spots are when you have these occur without much wind at all, which also is backed up the, by the atmospheric simulations. The, um, the polar night, even the polar spring, uh, in the South Pole is not a very windy place inside, n uh, near the, the South Pole. Um, and then finally, uh, I have these recurring slope linear, or RSL for short. These are things that occur, well, I'm going to talk about the ones that occur in the southern mid-latitudes of Mars. There are others that occur that appear to be the same thing or, or something very similar that occur in the equatorial region. And there are even one or two that occur in the northern hemisphere. But by, by and large, most of these that we've seen are in the southern mid-latitudes. Um, these occur only in the warm part of the year, um, the part of the year where the surface temperature is, is the highest. They perhaps coincidentally and, and I say that on purpose, happen when uh, the atmospheric surface pressure is the highest because the, the CO2 ice cap uh, in the south has basically completely sublimed away, or nearly so, but the northern cap hasn't caught up yet. And so the atmospheric pressure is sort of at its highest. That may or may not have anything to do with these, but it's an interesting correlation nonetheless, or coincidence. Um, we think that these somehow are water that's traveling underneath the ground, liquid water that's just below the surface, maybe a centimeter below the surface, and maybe a couple centimeters deep. There's a lot of controversy, and I'm actually part of this controversy, on whether this is salty water or not. Um, my personal take is that there are a lot of things that lead me to believe that it could be barely salty water or even fresh water. Uh, there are other groups that believe that it can't possibly be the case, and it must be really, really salty, briny water. Um, either way, it's really cool because it's, it's liquid moving right underneath the surface, and it's darkening the surface because some of the liquid is sort of, uh, by capillary action essentially, um, wetting a little bit the, the top of the soil, enough to make it look dark 
to an orbital uh, image. And these things move with time, which is why we think they're flows. We don't know whether they're continuous flows, like there's, a, you know, there's a, an outpouring that doesn't stop for a little while and then it stops, or if they're more uh, what might be called pulse flows or slug flows, where, um, where a little bit of water comes out each day, for example, and travels down slope and slowly makes the thing longer. Um, but the hallmark of these things is that they occur during the warm season, they occur on slopes that should be the warmest, that they get the most sun. They disappear in the colder parts of the year. Uh, so something about them disappears, and it doesn't seem to be dust covering them up. It seems to be some volatile that's being lost and making it go back or very nearly to the, uh, uh, the color it was before, the color the ground was before. Um, we don't know what the source of this water is. The, the best answer that we can give is, um, well, my personal favorite hypothesis is that there's ice there from a, a long time ago. How long? Don't know. But there's ice underneath, underneath some of these, these outcropping rocks and things that is, is melting when it's warmest, when the, the energy is able to penetrate far enough into the ground to melt these things. Um, there are other hypotheses that... Um, they think maybe there might be salty reservoirs of, of water moving around in the subsurface, and these are just their outlets. Um, no one really knows, but they're, they're really interesting from the standpoint of, yes, there probably is liquid water, even if it's briny, but it might not be, on, on Mars or right beneath the surface of Mars. And you know, it opens up uh, astrobiological questions as well. Uh, is there anything that could live in such a thing and survive the winter where there is no water? And that's basically it. Um, I'll just state that Mars is not currently an inactive planet. It's not a, 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 a world that is a desert, that nothing happens, you know, everything happened three billion years ago. Certain things maybe happened three billion years ago, but there's still a lot of interesting stuff that goes on right now on human time scales. If you could go there, travel there, you could see them in action with your own eyes if you were in the right, time, in the right place at the right time. Um, and there probably are likely many more of these extraordinary phenomena that go on on Mars that we don't know about yet. We don't have the resolution. We haven't looked at the right places yet. We haven't got lucky to see them at the right times yet. Um, and and I'll add that, especially underground, where we really can't see uh, without digging, um, there may be things going on that we don't have any idea about right now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, do we have any questions? Is there anything on Earth like those dark streaks you were just talking about under the surface that in the warmest time of the year? There are. In, an, in Antarctica, there are something that looks very similar. They're called Antarctic water tracks. Um, and on Earth, they, they form from melting snow. Uh, the snow melts and then percolates through the upper layer of the soil and, and goes downhill. But that's one of the reasons why I actually think that these on Mars could actually be fresher water or even fresh water and not brine because the Antarctic ones are not brine. They're, they have a very, very small amount of salt, so much that it would be hard for you to taste it if you tasted that water. Um, so there is an analog. We don't understand whether or not it's a perfect analog or not. I've got a question <coughs> dealing with, well, let me begin by stating that Apparently, Mars is a very dusty place. It is. At the same time, when you were talking about the CO2 clouds, you referred to supersaturation. Now, I would have imagined that the dust would serve as nuclei, and you really couldn't attain supersaturation. That thermodynamic control would always be available. Do you have a comment? Yeah, the, the comment is that the thermodynamics of CO2 um, condensation, uh, especially ice condensation, is that there's a thermodynamic barrier, a significant one, so that you have to get up to a certain critical supersaturation for nucleation to happen 
on those nuclei. And the smaller the nuclei, the higher the bar is. Um, and it turns out that there's a good reason to believe that a lot of the dust that is able to make its way into the polar night on Mars is very small. So it's, it, it's not actually, when you look at the, the detailed physics behind it, it's not actually terribly surprising that there are these, these large supersaturations. Was there a question on this side? Uh, I'm not sure I was it, but uh, there's been a lot of experiments done in the wind tunnels here at Ames. Ron Greeley set up a lab there to, to simulate physically a lot of these uh, gas dust interactions. Of, you never mentioned those, and I'm kind of surprised. Do, do they not shed any light on what you're doing? Oh, they absolutely shed some light. Um, they are analogs. They're not a dust devil on Mars. Um, they're not even a dust devil on Earth. They are a vortex that is similar to a dust devil on Earth. Um, but they're different in a lot of ways. In, in scale, um, they're also different in their energy source. The, the, vortices, the vortices that have been generated in the labs are mechanically generated, whereas the ones in nature are generated by buoyancy, um, hot air rising, um, with a little bit of mechanical um, influence involved to get them spinning. Uh, so yes, we can glean, and we have gleaned some information from those, but they're not the last word. They, they're, they're only a window into the complex beasts that these things are. Well, I think what Ron would say, sorry. I think what Ron Greeley would say if he were here, and I've, he's actually said this to me many times in different con connections, that you can, you can reproduce a phenomena me mechanically on Earth then you can try and describe it with the sort of theoretical modeling that, mm -hmm. that you're doing. And then if your models work for these control conditions on Earth, you can have more confidence that they apply to the, to, to the real world. Absolutely. And there are, there, there are strong similarities between both Earth dust devil modeling compared to the laboratory uh, dust devil analogs and Mars dust devil modeling as well. They're not, they don't perfectly agree, and that's part of where the disconnect is. Um, and we don't understand why they don't agree. We don't understand, is it because of the mechanical versus the buoyancy that's missing, or is it because of something else, the scale, right? Fluid sometimes behaves very similarly at, at disparate scales, but sometimes there are, the, you know, the, there are things, uh, there's a paradigm shift between scales that, that you're not properly representing in the lab. Um, and sometimes it takes a lot of data and a lot of time to figure out what exactly is the, the disconnection. OK, um, Tim, nice talk. Um, I had a question about your CO2 uh, condensation and, and clouds and uh, plumes, and just kind of a basic one, because you, your model, if I understand it right, being so sophisticated, it allows for acoustic modes. And I was just wondering if you excite acoustic modes when you condense in the CO2 atmosphere. Absolutely. Um, yeah, these things would create very strong sound waves. Um, even the, the condensation of the CO2 clouds directly creates sound waves in the atmosphere. Now, whether or not they would be a frequency that your ears would be able to turn into anything useful is another question. But, but they're directly creating sound waves. And it's something that, that on Earth, you, you really don't have a direct parallel. Uh, you have indirect creation of sound waves on Earth, um, but, but you don't really have the main constituent of the atmosphere uh, condensing out and creating a, 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 a under-dense void that is essentially the, the kernel of a sound wave. So. Um I gather that the Mars Maven mission is mostly to look for water vapor, but I was wondering if it was also something that could help uh, you define these, these CO2 clouds that seem to have captured everyone's interest here. There are some CO2 clouds that form at very high altitude or fairly high altitudes, higher than I usually talk about, um, 80 kilometers up. And they're, they're much more cirrus like They don't seem to be convective as far as we know. Um, you know they're, they form because the, the conditions necessary for their formation are met, but there's not enough uh, latent heat there, or there's something 
that is preventing it from being convective. Um, Maven may shed some light on it, but Maven is mostly a, a higher altitude mission. It's looking for things escaping from the atmosphere at the very top uh, and things that may have escaped over, uh, over time. Uh, so yes, of course, more data is, is, is much better than zero data, um, but most of the things that I talk about are much, much lower down and Maven is not going to directly have uh, any bearing on those. Indirectly, yes. I think we had one more question over here. Ah, Jill. Yeah, with the RSLs, what was the total lapse time of those images that you showed us? And from one spring to the next, do those features overprint exactly? They can overprint, but they don't always. Um, they, there seem to be, there's some sort of uh, channeling that they create. It's not enough, it, you really can't see it in stereo, uh, in the stereo DEMs that they created these things, uh, digital elevation maps. Um, it, it's too slight of a variation, but there probably is some sort of channeling that's going on. A lot of times these are, I, I showed you a picture of the gullies, a lot of times these are superimposed on the edges of gullies and actually go down the edges of the gullies. Um, and there may even be a genetic connection between the two. The same process magnified 10 or 100 times created the gullies, perhaps. Um, we don't know, but it's an idea. Um, and as for time, some of these occur over, well, we're limited to how fast high rise can image these things, how, how fast they can re-image the same site. Um, but we've definitely seen changes within weeks um, and sometimes uh, less than 10 days. Uh, so, so these things definitely uh, vary, but sometimes uh, some of them are only for that week. They change one time. You see one change and then they don't change anymore within your, um, your observational coverage. But there are other times when it, when it changes for tens or hundreds of days. Uh, it just keeps on length lengthening. And sometimes they come together. They, sometimes they have a dendritic pattern where um, lots of sources come together into a single sort of RSL feature. So it's, it, they're very interesting beasts. And wouldn't you love to send her over there? Yes. Okay, well let's stop the big questions there. Tim will be here at the podium for a while if anybody has any more questions. Um, here, sir, is your mug. Uh, oh, yes. thank you. <laughs> the requisite mug, thank you. <laughs> let's thank him again. Thanks for coming, everybody.